Hi, this is Ashish Shankar and I welcome you to the next in the series of Know Your 4C Manager. Uh, today we have with us somebody who has uh, close to two decades of experience in the capital markets. Uh, he's a MBA and he's been managing money at Tata Asset Management Company as well as at LNT Asset Management Company over 17 years now. He manages close to 9,000 crores at LNT and has uh, chalked up a very, very impressive track record of close to 26.5% CAGR over the last five years in his flagship fund, LNT Value Fund. Uh, welcome, Venu Gopal, uh, to, to, to this show. Um, we are in interesting times right now. We are in the midst of an earnings season and there is an impending general elections next year. Uh, how do you see you know, markets evolving from here, let's say, over the next year or so? And uh, you know, how are you positioning your portfolios? So I think the markets are already uh, slightly worried about the uh, election calendar that is likely to unfold over the next uh, 12 months or so. A uh, bit of the correction that we have seen is partly because of that, um, apart from the global reasons as well, uh, including the fears and the expectation of a trade war and what if it escalates and therefore growth slows down, etc. So I think all of those worries, um, coupled with the fact that you've had some disruptions in the Indian market itself, you had a capital gains coming in uh, on long term uh, and also uh, the reclassification of schemes which uh, you know or categorization of schemes which again um, uh, disrupted markets to some extent in between uh, we've had all of that play out and which is why you you are seeing what you're seeing right now in terms of the distortion in markets i think there is a significant risk aversion that we are seeing today um, and which is why you are seeing the high quality uh, the perceived uh, consistent performers or the better, uh, um, uh, stronger growth performers uh, doing well in the markets and the rest of the markets actually going down significantly. What we are trying to do is to not chase some of these uh, high quality, uh, expensive uh, growth stocks. Uh, whatever we have, we continue to hold. We are not trying to exit some of them given the valuation differential. Of course, valuations have gone to you know, significantly high levels right now, which is a discomfort. Uh, wherever we've been out of the markets or out of, uh, uh, we've not really invested in terms of uh, sector exposures from the, within the benchmark. We are trying to balance that uh, to whatever extent possible um, and uh, position the, the for the next 12 months uh, for a little uncertain period. I mean, I think the broad market is corrected enough uh, with all these fears and uncertainties, but you never know the end game in terms of uh, the trade wars, nor uh, do you know how this political scenario is going to unfold. And to that extent, I think one needs to be cautious for the next 12 months. And to that extent, again, we are trying to balance the portfolios and be a little more closer to the benchmark, trying to fix the missing pieces uh, where we've not had a significant exposure. We're trying to bridge those gaps. Uh, you have a rich experience of two decades in capital markets. Uh, what have been your key learnings and how has that fed into your investment approach or framework? So I think uh, one of the key lessons uh, from this uh, year, few years that I've been in the industry and managing money is that one needs to be really grounded and humble uh, because the markets can do a very different thing than what you, are, uh, uh, you and I are expecting. Uh, markets don't give, uh, uh, you know, don't care about what is the you, your fa fair value assumption of stocks uh, or your view on different sectors. Uh, you can have any view you want. You can do as much research as you want, but the markets can do something else. The markets know far more than what you know, and you have to accept that. And to that extent, you need to be grounded and humble. Extending that to the next level, I think one of the big learnings is that if you have mind blocks, uh, you know, when I say mind blocks, I'm saying that. If I, as a fund manager, say I will not buy these these sectors given these parameters or I will not buy these set of companies, unless of course it is a governance related issue, uh, then it is different. But otherwise, if you have mind blocks on companies or sectors, I think it becomes very difficult to really perform in a, in a uh, market. So uh, one has to be grounded, one has to be open in terms of what you can, or where you can invest. Um, and. The other big lesson is also that you can't fall asleep at the wheel. 
um, you have to continuously uh, you know review your portfolio monitor your portfolio see if you're you know uh, you need to do any course correction uh, and and that's the only way you can be a little more consistent and and as i said you need to be open to make those course corrections and you can't just stick to your view saying that this is my view uh, and I would be right over a longer period of time. A longer period can be five years. I mean, you, you never know and markets can remain, uh, uh, you know, distorted for a long period of time. So uh, those are some of the lessons that, uh, you know, I've learned over the years and has helped me in my, uh, you know, portfolio construction. Right. So what is your approach to portfolio constructions? I mean, how do you uh, decide which companies uh, will find a way into your portfolio? Are so, there any frameworks that you use? Yeah, so in general, I like good quality companies which are doing well and which are likely to do well over time. And if you can get those at the right prices, which is so in, a, in a very simple way of looking at uh, things, you know, it's just that you're buying the, the good quality names at a reasonable price that you uh, uh, get in the markets and you'll wait for those prices to come. Uh, and uh, to my mind, uh, remaining invested for a longer period of time is the only way to make significant alpha and uh, returns uh, from this market and not just keep churning portfolios and you know moving from one stock to the other. That's clearly not uh, the approach that I have. I like to build portfolios over time. So uh, again, extending from one of the learnings that I just mentioned to you, knowing fully well that the market is far more smarter and superior than I am in terms of knowledge, uh, I would like my thesis to be corroborated by the market over time before I really make a significant exposure in any stock. So which means I take time to build my positions in, any, in, in a portfolio. And uh, similarly for exiting a uh, stock from the portfolio, I st again take time to exit. I don't do things at one go saying that, okay, this is uh, the price I thought of and this is the price I'm looking to exit. You know, So I take time to do that and which help, which has helped me in ensuring that the top end of my portfolio is always in the money and it's it's given me significant uh, returns uh, the the additional uh, kicker in terms of returns as well as alpha uh, over over this uh, period of time that's in general now i am managing different uh, types of portfolios and therefore the objectives are different i have a value fund which is very clearly it has a value orientation I have a large cap fund which is, uh, uh, you know, there is a market cap orientation and there's a cutoff in terms of market cap where you can invest. I'm managing a business cycles fund which is a very, very different concept. It plays on the economic cycle and, you know, uh, so very different types of products and therefore one has to um, wear different hats when you look at different portfolios uh, because the objectives are different. What you have told investors uh, are, are very different. Um, the universe of stocks are different, so you need to be, uh, uh, each fund has to be managed differently um, based on the objective and, and what is required from you. Um, coming to the uh, LNT Value Fund, which is your uh, flagship product where you manage the largest assets, uh, what is the mandate of the fund and you know how do you go about constructing a portfolio in that fund? So uh, the Value Fund is, uh, you know, uh, it, it, was a kind of unique product. We had hardly two or three other products in the market at that time. Uh, we uh, took over this from fund from Fidelity uh, when we took over the assets of Fidelity in 2012. Uh, it's a fund which has a, a, a value orientation and I'll explain what we believe is value because value is a loosely defined term. People look at, uh, talk about it in different uh, ways. There are two aspects to any uh, purchase that you do in the market. One is you pay a price and therefore price is what you pay uh, and, and that price is actually measured in terms of different valuation tools and you use different tools based on the sector based on the thesis the market condition etc you can change you can look at different tools you have price to earnings multiple price to book value multiple you have eva bid market cap to sales and all of that you 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 constantly look at so price is important, therefore the measure of price is also important and therefore the valuation is critical. I mean it is for any fund, any uh, investment that you make in the markets, the valuation is critical. But that's where it stops. More important for us in this value fund is what is on offer from the company or the business over time. And that is more critical for us than just getting something which is, you know, at a discount. You know, you keep always looking for a discount in every fund that we run. So that's that's just a that's a given that's a hygiene but what is more important here is that you need to have value creation from the business and from the stock over time that 
uh, if it is there and that is not appreciated by the market adequately or appropriately uh, and therefore it is offered at a discount uh, uh, to historic multiples or let's say within the sector or even within the index or the the market as a whole then that offers value and uh, we try and be in you know in in companies or stocks that offer uh, or, or create value over time or businesses that create value over time and we um, want to have a definite timeline over which that value creation is happening so if if you if, you, if you're talking of growth uh, you can't just look at growth uh, improving over the uh, you know just uh, uh, one or two years we need that business to really scale up over time and something changing fundamentally which takes the the growth to a higher trajectory or if it is um, uh, uh, any other parameter like for example subsidiaries getting listed and therefore value unlocking happening from the, the parent balance sheet you need to have a timeline in mind or you need to uh, ensure that that event is likely to happen at some stage and not just an expectation uh, because that va value unlocking has to happen over that time horizon and then therefore it uh, uh, it it helps your fund to outperform and, and the alpha to be generated uh, so Venu, uh, for the benefit of our uh, investors, could you elaborate a little more on your framework, maybe give us some concrete examples that uh, in the past have worked for you? Uh, value Fund is a unique concept uh, where we are, uh, the orientation is on uh, assessing the value proposition in a, in a business. Uh, and I'll explain that because it's uh, value is a very loosely defined term and people get confused uh, uh, between value and valuation. Uh, these are two very different things. Um, so whenever you go uh, buy uh, any product or uh, you know, if you talk in terms of the stock market, you buy a stock, there are two parts to the equation. One is the price that you pay. So price is what you pay for anything that you buy. Uh, it can be measured by way of a valuation tool and that is, uh, you, uh, you, as you know, price to earnings multiple or price to book value multiple or any of the other multiples that you see you use on a regular basis depending on the industry and the market conditions etc. It's important to get a discounted valuation always uh, and we try and do that in every fund that we run. Whenever we buy any stock, we look at the discount that is available. But what is more important uh, to us in this value fund is to get stocks that can deliver value over a longer period of time. So we look at what the business is offering over time and um, in the in the context of a growing uh, economy at a stage of evolution where we are in today, there are more growth stocks and so therefore one of the, fa the ways of uh, unlocking value over time uh, or the way we look at it is that growth can actually be higher over a longer period of time and let's say for example something which is compounding at 10% per annum, a stock is compounding at 10% per annum and you have a change in the management, uh, you have a change in promoter group, it could even be uh, a change in Baton from or a handover of Baton from the father to the son. Uh, so there is a generation change which is actually helping boost the growth over a period of time because the father is used to managing uh, uh, the company or the business in a different way and the and the son or the daughter who has been educated abroad most of the times in you know the way what we are seeing today has a different approach and might you know uh, a world view and therefore the way uh, he or she manages would be different so that could be one you also have new product introductions you have new uh, markets that they are targeting like export markets etc so all of that uh, or, or it could just be a tailwind for the sector. I mean, and we have done that in the value fund. We have, for example, uh, in the last five or six years, we have, uh, we have invested in sectors like tires, uh, sectors like uh, textiles, chemicals, mid-cap cement, construction. Um, uh, it's, a lot of these have had uh, you know, significant tailwind at different points in time. And some of them we continue to hold. And you know, we believe tire stocks uh, or, or cement stocks continue to offer value. We believe uh, some of the construction names, uh, given this mayhem in the market, offers value now over a, uh, a period of time. So uh, sectors with tailwinds, again, are something that we like, which we believe over the next three to five years time horizon we look at can deliver value. Uh, so growth is one uh, aspect of, of that value creation, increasing growth or delta growth from what we've had in the past. So that's something we look at consciously. There's also dividends which can offer, give you value. So cash flows resulting in dividends. Uh, uh, however, uh, as I earlier said, given the stage of evolution of the country and the economy, the market, we don't have too many high dividend yield companies in the in the market today. So 
you know, and most companies have uh, use of capital uh, for their growth and there is plenty of growth ahead of us. And to that extent, uh, looking for dividend yield is not something which is really a great exercise, but we still do have some dividend yield stocks as well. Uh, and a third category would be companies where from the balance sheet of the parent you have subsidiaries and you have investments and some at some point in time they will get listed some point in time those uh, and and those subsidiaries may be yes the subsidiaries themselves may be growing at a, a reasonable rate and and that may be may not be adequately captured in the sum of parts valuation so those kind of uh, stocks also we look at and are part of the portfolios we have several of them we have uh, the entire uh, the, the most um, recent one which where we have seen significant unlocking has been the hdfc group um, and uh, in the last 12 months or 18 months we have seen the insurance uh, sector uh, opening up and and one company within that space uh, you have now the asset management company getting listed so multiple companies from the parent balance sheet uh, offering uh, value over a period of time. So we've had investments from you know for a long time and that's actually now giving us significant um, gains. Several such examples I can give you uh, from uh, on all, all three or four uh, types or, or buckets that I would uh, classify stocks in. Uh, but that's the, the thought process. I mean, um, we look for companies and businesses which can deliver or uh, uh, can unlock value over a period of time. And if that is, um, offered to us in terms of a, at a discounted valuation either on a relative basis with respect to the market or with respect to the sector or with respect to the uh, uh, historic multiples then we uh, you know buy into those stocks in the portfolio how do you allow, uh, avoid value traps because sometimes you know you you find something cheap but uh, it can end up becoming a value trap absolutely i think uh, it's a very good question uh, something that uh, we've always uh, tried very consciously to do and yet uh, it's a struggle constantly because there are plenty of times uh, where uh, you encounter companies that remain duds for a long period of time they don't perform to the extent that you would expect or desire either your your thesis of that that catalyst that is likely to change that uh, you know uh, uh, growth in earnings or whatever you were expecting is not playing out uh, or uh, it could be that there are other fundamental factors, structural factors, which are uh, part of the sector, part of the industry, which you are not aware of and which you have not factored in into your thesis. So you need to re you know, review your you know, stands, your investment thesis on a regular basis to see whether it is really playing out, especially in a value fund kind of scenario, because you can just remain invested for endless you know, quarters and not get anything out of it so that's that's a clear value trap and we have seen umpteen uh, there are umpteen examples of uh, stocks in that category uh, where the you know if you see the optically the valuation looks very cheap i mean there are companies which have been at three times five times uh, 3p 5p 6p for a long period of time and and they don't go anywhere i mean they they don't appreciate uh, or or uh, get re-rated Having said that, there, you know, since you brought up this topic, there are examples of uh, sectors where for a long period of time they were perceived as value traps, but that changes over time, you know, for, for some reason. I gave you the example of tires. Uh, clearly, the tire sector for a very long period of time, the valuations were between, let's say, one and a half, two times on a forward basis to about six, seven times on a forward basis. The best company was at seven, eight times in terms of forward PE multiple. For a very long period of time, people who had invested would have not made significant money or, you know, really good returns from any of these. They were, they were kind of value traps for a very long period of time. What changed was that you had rubber prices really correcting significantly along with the other commodities, but the rubber cycle actually coming in favor um, uh, with significant supply coming in. And that gave a structural boost to the, to the uh, sector uh, as also the, the growth in the automobile space coming at the same time. And which meant that for a longer period of time, the pricing power, the uh, growth uh, uh, for the sector for, for large companies in the space was getting or was likely to get better and we played that uh, you know, uh, quite well. So there are at times uh, some of these value traps if you where, where you can uh, I mean they may look value traps for uh, you know uh, for some period of time but if you can identify those catalysts which can change and which um, uh, are likely 
and if you can put a time frame to it and or if you can identify when it will happen i think uh, you can still invest in some of them but you have to be careful uh, the, uh, like i said it's always a struggle uh, your thesis can go wrong or it may not play out the way you were expected and we try and you know get out of our or cut losses from uh, some of these value traps from the portfolios i think uh, there are examples currently also we have uh, at least three or four of them where uh, nothing much has happened but the good thing for me at least i can say the way i have managed the value fund portfolio is that i don't increase the exposure too much and i mentioned this in the earlier uh, uh, i don't increase my exposures unless the market corroborates what i'm my thesis is so if the market is not supporting what i'm thinking i am not likely to increase my exposure and say i will go to a 5% weightage in the stock so even if i have a value uh, trap or something that is a dud or not performing i would probably have a 40 basis points or a 25 basis points which is not really impacting it so much so i and and at some point i will cut my loss and move out if if it continues to be a value trap so that brings me to my next question when do you sell a stock so um it depends on a uh, number of parameters uh, obviously the most important one uh, and all pervasive all uh, you know something that covers all uh, scenarios is corporate governance obviously if the corporate governance deteriorates and if there is some reason for you to believe that uh, it's not the way you want uh, it to be managed then uh, you vote on your feet uh, if you can you do that if you can't you you, you still fight uh, uh, fight it out for the investors because they have their money in with you um so uh, that's one uh, you know uh, common area where you you would want to sell the other is of course the if the the valuation has reached a you know significantly high level which is uh, discomforting for you um Uh, where the downside uh, uh, is is significant if there is some you know something goes wrong and we have seen that in multiple cases um that's when you you trim your exposures you don't try to put it in your top 10 or top 20 stocks you you bring it down so which is uh, again i'm 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 repeating myself but uh, the way i have uh, been managing this value fund portfolio and uh, over time uh is by calibrating exposures based on the conviction levels based on the valuations based on the uh the merit of that investments and to that extent i you know stock to a lower uh, exposure level if i feel that the valuation is really going out of whack the third reason could be if you know to be just opportunistic and uh, you know you have let's say for example in the value fund portfolio i have bought something which is uh, you know let's say 12 times or 15 times forward p multiple and it goes to 25 times and now uh, within the same sector or in a different sector but um, a similar value proposition is emerging has emerged which is again giving you a you know a, um, you know a lower multiple and lower downside which protects your uh, uh, you know the money that you're putting in then you would want to switch from one to the other but in most cases we don't do that unless uh, you know it's it's not uh, it's either a cyclical uh, sector or a, a company that you would wa- not want to hold for a very long period of time or you know. so one of the key things that i look for um, a, in any purchase that i make a fresh purchase that i make in any stock is that can i hold this forever uh, you know that's one thing if i can answer that question as a yes a resounding yes then it remains in my portfolio for a much longer period of time so if you look at my portfolio for the last 5 or 6 years there would be several stocks that have remained constant of course in a you know when you run a value fund uh, it becomes difficult to justify stocks which are at you know significantly higher multiples especially if you when you have bought it at a far lower multiple and it's got a, a re-rating or your thesis has played out well then it becomes difficult to justify beyond a point of time but in my large cap fund for the last 6 years that i've been managing you will have uh, more than 50% of the stocks the same so that's something which is very important to me that Uh, i remain invested for a longer time horizon i remain patiently invested and therefore get that compounding right um and uh, uh, i have seen that that helps uh, rather than churning portfolio so our portfolio churn is also much lower uh, according to the research that we have uh, you know over the next 6 7 years even if india grows at a nominal gdp of let's say 12% uh, you can re- easily double your gdp i mean Today we are at about close to 2.4, 2.5 trillion dollars, and we can become a 5 trillion dollar economy. Mm-hmm. Now, when we analyze this journey of two and a half to 5 trillion dollars for a lot of other economies, 
it threw up a lot of exciting uh, outcomes in terms of a lot of businesses getting created, a lot of companies becoming very, very large. So according to you, what are the big opportunities for India over the next seven years and as a result as an investor, uh, are there any sectors or themes that you think look very exciting? Sure. Uh, again, a good question. I think there are several opportunities that will unfold over, over a period of time as, as India progresses from a, a developing nation and over time into a, a better or more developed country. Um, as you progress, as you improve in terms of uh, per capita incomes, obviously your uh, income levels are growing and your uh, propensity to spend also has, uh, is growing. We have a significant middle class population which is an aspiring population and therefore to my mind I think the next 7-8 years the consumption theme is likely to be one of the strongest drivers of the economy. Um, uh, and it's unfortunate that the investment piece or the gross capital formation in the in the in the, in the economy is not uh, measuring up to what you would have wanted um, in an economy like ours and we are far lower in terms of the standards in terms of infrastructure in the country but despite that given the requirements of the nation given the fact that we are we are still struggling to grow uh, my sense is that the driver for the next few years will have to be consumption and uh, within that, you know, the urban and urban consumption in any, is in any case uh, doing very well. I think we are seeing some traction on the rural side as well. Uh, uh, the investment piece will take a little while longer and probably take uh, another 12 to 18 months, not, maybe not 12, I think 18 to 24 months for um, that cycle to really come back to uh, a strong one. But over time, that also has to catch up. So if I see the progression that is likely to have, uh, you know, um, over the next few years and what are the drivers that I see, I see consumption as the key driver, both urban and rural. Urban is anyway kicking and doing very well. Rural is the next piece, which is with a reasonable monsoon, hopefully, and with the government thrust on infrastructure, on uh, the, the rural uh, job creation as well as the infrastructure around the rural economy. I believe the rural economy also should start uh, performing well uh, and, and drive consumption, followed by uh, the government spending on infrastructure, which continues in any case. So we have seen the last few years the uh, government thrust on public infrastructure, including roads, irrigation, railways, etc., metros, all of that is continuing. I hope, hopefully, uh, despite the fact that we have an election year, that will continue to some extent and the orders that have come uh, or been have been awarded should see some fruition and some activity also improving. So that is the next uh, you know driver that I see. And finally, end of it, you would have uh, uh, the the export story and then followed by the investments uh, the investment cycle from the private sector. So that's how I see it unfolding. Now, when you talk of sectors that or the opportunities that um, this is likely to throw up in terms of consumption from a very macro 40,000 feet view, I can say that with the kind of population, 140 crore population that we have and with such a big a burgeoning middle class with aspirations, with a better exposure given the internet penetration, the uh, media penetration, etc. I think the trends in terms of customer spends and in terms of uh, um, consumer spends are going to change dramatically. If you see in this country, if you just analyze the kind of stocks that we have today in the market, for a 140 crore population, we have hardly one uh, real estate company which is large cap. We have hardly one um, retail company which is large cap and that is, that's, that's a far cry from what it should be at this stage of the evolution of this, uh, this economy. You have no hotel company which is large cap. You know, so, you know, I see multiple such opportunities you emerging. You see a lot of new businesses Some of them, and absolutely. The insurance space has now come. So, any play on that demographic space or, uh, and on consumption is likely to do well over time. But some of these sectors which are a no-brainer given the way other uh, countries have progressed and the way they have developed over time and the cycle that they have gone through, it's a no-brainer to me that some of the high-quality names in the uh, you know listed in the market today will be at multiple times of what they are over the next 10 years, and that's the the beauty of this market, and that's the the uh, luckiest part for a gen for our generation that we are in a stage where we can visualize that some of these sectors can grow significantly, and therefore some of the high-quality names. Uh, can become the, the, the next blue chips and be in the index in the next 5 or 10 years.
Great. I think that was a wonderful perspective. Uh, one of the questions we keep getting asked, and you know, we have uh, this in most of our discussions, is how do you time equity markets? Should you be even timing it? Uh, what should be the approach uh, for, for investors to build an equity portfolio? What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, so I mean, there's been endless debate on this topic and I think uh, timing to my mind is a very futile exercise uh, for the simple fact that nobody can predict the future. Uh, and the short term uh, is as unpredictable as it is. Uh, you, uh, there is no formula, proven formula, which, which can help you predict how markets are going to behave in the short term. And to that extent, it is extremely futile to say that I will wait for that 5% correction or 10% correction or, uh, uh, you know, I will wait for this price to, you know, come and then I will uh, jump into the stock or the market. I think it's a very futile exercise. Um, and there is uh, enough evidence which or data which points to the fact that, uh, you know, uh, logging into the markets or staying, uh, you know, having bought into the markets, remaining invested patiently for a longer period of time has been the way to make money or create wealth over, uh, uh, for investors. In the markets, Absolutely. The only is the only solution. And uh, to my mind, I think people try and do this timing uh, just to, uh, just with a belief that they can control the environment. They have control over what is happening around them. I think it's a futile belief. Um, uh, a lot of variables change uh, and uh, you try and time it and your emotions and your fears and your worries and everything comes into it uh, and then you, you completely miss it and umpteen examples and in the recent past also you've seen people having missed out the mid and small cap rally the last three years, two years. You had very good corrections in 2016 in the first three months of calendar year 2016 massive correction the nifty was down more than 20 percent uh, you would have not got something like that yes uh, currently this calendar year from jan to now you had a significant correction in the broad markets yes people are worried people are saying okay i will wait for this market to correct i will let it finish i will let it happen it's extremely uh, difficult uh, or very improbable that you would be able to time it to perfection and get the real bottom. Uh, uh, to my mind, I think it's it's a no-brainer that you have to just buy. You have to if you like something, you you have done your work, identified the right people, the right funds or the right stocks. I think you have to get in and remain patiently invested over time. That's the only way you can make uh, good returns. Right. Uh, you know, at Motilal Oswal Wealth Management, we have uh, you know the philosophy of knowledge first and creating winning portfolios through knowledge. Um, any books that you'd recommend to our investors uh, which, you, which have inspired you or given you the foundation uh, you know, for investments? Yeah, I mean, there are multiple books, but the two uh, which really are outstanding and I think anybody or everybody should uh, read them are one, The Intelligent Investor, by Benjamin Graham, of course, uh, that's like a has, textbook. Absolutely, it's a Bible and the other is the um, Peter Lynch book, uh, One Upon One Upon Wall Street. So I think that is, uh, those are books which have influenced me, uh, given me the basics of uh, how to invest from the beginning and um, especially the uh, intelligent investor on, on the value investing uh, framework and what to look for. You know, things like diversification, uh, low debt uh, companies, uh, remaining patiently invested, um, uh, prices what you pay, values what you get. You know, those are, you know, f philosophies of Benjamin Graham which have come out uh, of uh, such books. And I think some of these books uh, are a must read for, for any investor. Right. And, uh, you know, during your formative years, any um, mentors or um, you know, investment uh, gurus that you, you had looked up to or helped, you know, form your own uh, thought process? Uh, uh, unfortunately, we've not had that kind of a track record or period where Indian uh, investing has been flourishing or, you know, we've had... Or, or any global investors? Yeah, I mean, global or investors like, uh, you know, Peter Lynch, for example, or uh, Warren Buffett, as we all are, you know, big fans of uh, him. Um, Benjamin Graham obviously uh, comes to my mind. So those are, you know, great figures, legendary figures whom you would always uh, look up to um, and and uh, keep reading, keep uh, uh, understanding or learning from them all the time. I think those are the figures. But if it when it comes to India, there are there are plenty of good people. I'm not saying I'm not downplaying that. 
But the fact is that we have not had that kind of history of uh, fund management and this industry being so, uh, and the public uh, markets or public investing markets that I am part of. I don't think you've had that kind of history to really talk about of, uh, but there are great people within the domestic market as well. So I, uh, I've always believed that there are better people in the market. So I, I'm, I'm open to learning from anybody I can, you know, from, uh, I can learn from. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, Venu. I think the, for me, the conversation was very interesting and insightful. Um, and uh, thanks for being on the show. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me on the show. It's a great pleasure to talk to you um, and uh, hope that your investors will uh, benefit from uh, my learnings at least. I'm <laughs> uh, that was uh, Mr. Venugopal Mangat from LNT Asset Management. He manages the flagship LNT Value Fund. Uh, I found the conversation very interesting and insightful. I hope you found it as in fight insightful too. Uh, if you have any feedback, please write in to us on our email, follow us on Twitter or watch our videos online on YouTube. Thank you very much.